Good evening. I'm Russ McCullough. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm coming to you on behalf of the Archdale Church of Christ. And today we are examining our Thursday, Friday, and Saturday broadcast that we call Today's Textus Receptus, or Today's Received Text. We are following this Bible, the Daily Bible in chronological order. And today's reading contains a passage from the book of Amos. And so we're going to focus on that. So we appreciate your viewing and sharing of these videos. If you find them helpful and useful, and most of all biblical, uh, we encourage you to share those videos with those that you know, wherever they might be. And again, we appreciate your presence today for this broadcast. As many are aware of in the United States, today being June the 19th, in the year of our Lord 2020, we are celebrating in America a holiday known as Juneteenth. Juneteenth. And I just want to share with you a little background on Juneteenth because it has a lot to do with the passage that we're going to explore today from Amos 5, chapter 5, verses 10 through 24. And here's some information. This is from People Magazine. Juneteenth is the longest running African American holiday in the United States. Juneteenth is short for June the 19th and marks the day that slavery ended in America. The Emancipation Proclamation, which abolished slavery, was issued by Abraham Lincoln on January 1, 1863. But it took until 1865 for the last enslaved people to be freed. That's because the proclamation only applied to places under Confederate control, but people in Confederate states weren't the only ones who enslaved people of African descent. In fact, there were border states and rebel territories that continued to keep enslaved peoples. Texas, as a result, actually became a hot spot for enslavers who fled their states with the people they were enslaving. On June the 19th, 1865, federal troops led by General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas, and took control of the state marking the official end of slavery as the state's 250,000 enslaved people were freed. The year 2020 marks the 155th anniversary of the holiday. Although Granger announced that all enslaved people were to be freed, enslavers and plantation owners were left to announce the news and often waited until the harvest season or until a government official came to enforce the proclamation themselves. Because the Emancipation Proclamation also did not apply to states in the Union, remaining enslaved people were not liberated until the 13th Amendment was ratified on the December 18, 1865. Even after the ratification of the 13th Amendment, African Americans were often forced into other forms of servitude any new type of slavery. So Juneteenth is a significant holiday in the United States as it should be. It marks the end of the rebellion. The Civil War ended as did slavery, but at a fierce and terrible cost that cannot even be grasped by us today. Some 625,000 men died in the conflict between April of 1861 and April of 1865. What amounted to 10% of the entire male population of the United States perished. 
if it were today and the same percentages ran true, we would have a casualty rate of 6 million people. It was horrific. It was terrible. It was costly. It was bloody. Because some men decided they were superior to other men and enslaved them against their will and forced them into lifelong servitude. But thank God, it was over on June the 19th, 1865. Now, much work needed to be done and still remains to be done today. I'm reminded of what Winston Churchill said of the first Allied victory in World War II at El Alamein in Egypt when Montgomery defeated Rommel and he made a proclamation to the nation in a radio address and he, he said, it's not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but perhaps it is the end of the beginning. And June the 10th, June 10th, June the 19th, we might say was the end of the beginning. And our work continues today. And Amos the prophet speaks from the pages of history to all those future generations about justice and injustice in societies. And so we want to read the passage and make some applications because it is Juneteenth and we are reflecting on many, many terrible things that happened in our past that we are now attempting to work on and rectify and make right. Hear the word of God. They hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor, and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions, and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, turn aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, he who is prudent, will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. And that phrase is the title of tonight's lesson. For it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, he begins again in verse 14, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. As you have said, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, and all the squares there shall be wailing. And all the streets they shall say, Alas, alas. They shall call the farmers to mourning and to wailing those who are skilled in lamentation. And in all vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through your midst says the Lord. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. 
Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feast, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But as Dr. King quoted, But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. God is contrasting good and evil. He's contrasting evil times with what could be good times. And so we want to look at 13, excuse me, eight signs, eight signs of an evil time. Eight signs of an evil time that are detailed for us in this passage. First of all, an evil time is a time when people hate correction. They do not want to be told what to do or when to do it or how to do it by anyone. They want to rule their own lives. They hate being corrected. How dare you tell me that two and two equal four? Secondly, people living in an evil time hate the truth. We're reminded of Paul's rhetorical question to the Galatians. Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? People who live in an evil time hate the truth any kind of truth. Number three, people living in an evil time take advantage of the poor. They find ways to take advantage of the least among God's brethren. And number four, they accomplish this by over taxing the poor. And you might say, well, how are the poor overtaxed? Uh, they're not, in this country, they're not taxed at all. Oh, yes, but they are. They are. When the government says we don't tax people under a certain income, they do because they extract money out of their paycheck and hold it and then give it back to them in a lump sum long after it's needed to pay for the necessities of life. It is a terrible thing for people not to be able to pay rent, not to be able to buy food, not to be able to provide transportation for themselves because the money that they need is extracted by the government and then held without interest for a year. How else are the, the poor overtaxed? Well, they're charged exorbitant rates of interest if their credit is not at a certain number. Nobody pays more to borrow money than a poor man. This should not be. The poor are relegated to housing that is inferior to what is considered average. They're crowded places. They're far away. They're difficult to get to. 
There are neighborhoods where crime is rampant. Yes, the poor are overtaxed and taken advantage of. People living in an evil time berate the righteous. Nobody is more vilified in our culture than those who take a stand for what is right and good. In an evil time, people take bribes. And people say, well, I've never taken a bribe. Well, have you? Bribes do not necessarily just consist of money. People are bribed to do wrong because they're bribed with the promise of greater influence. They're bribed with the promise of greater acceptance by the movers and the shakers in the society, in the government, in the company in which they work for, etc. They're bribed by peer pressure and popularity. If you change your vote, if you change your mind, if you change your conviction, if you change your opinion to this, then you will be popular. People take all kinds of bribes in all kinds of ways to oppress others. In an evil time, number seven, people ignore the needy. When people come and have a need, it's ignored. And I'm not talking about government handouts here or whatever you might want to call it. I'm talking about us as individuals. When another individual comes and asks to borrow money, do we loan it to them? Do we loan money and demand its return? Or do we forgive and forget? And there's all kinds of people's needs that go unmet. When someone just wants to have a conversation, do we converse? If somebody just wants to have a friend, are we friendly? If someone walks up to us in a conversation and want to be part of that conversation, do we ignore them and look at them as if they're not there? Yes, there's all kinds of ways to ignore the needy. And then number eight, the most insidious of them of them all, as the passage says, the prudent remain silent in an evil time. Yes, there's many good men and women in America today. For fear of reprisal of some sort or another, for fear of losing a promotion, for fear of losing a job, for fear of being disenfranchised from their family and friends. They just don't say anything. Oh, yes, they believe the right things, but they don't say it. They don't let it be known because they're afraid. They're silent. Evil times are silent times by many righteous people. And so those are the eight signs of an evil time. But as so often is the case in the scripture, we're not left crumpled on the ground, burnt and worthless and dead. No, God through Jesus Christ, reaches his hand down and, and says, I love you. You can get up now. You're living in an evil time, but guess what? You 
me, any Christian, can do things and say things that will turn an evil time into a good time. And verse 14 and 15, he tells us what it is that we need to do. We're living in evil times. There's no doubt. Injustice is rampant. And as we talked about earlier in Second Chronicles 19, the definition of injustice is to help the wicked and love haters of God. And then in chapter 19, verse 7, he defines what justice is. If you want to know what justice is, real justice, real definition of the real word from God's perspective, it is this. Second Chronicles 19, verse 7. You need to be just by emulating God, by not showing partiality, and by not taking bribes. That is what it means to be just, to be a just person. And so God tells us, you might be living in evil times, but you don't have to participate. You may remember billboards in the recessions of 08 and the recessions of 02 and the recessions of 92, 82, 74. Every time there's a recession, a billboard goes up. You've seen it, I'm sure. They say there's a recession, but we refuse to participate. So it is, if we live in an evil time, we have to say to ourselves and to God and to each other, and to strangers. The times are evil, but I am not going to participate. I am going to be a counter-cultural revolutionary for God. I'm going the opposite direction. Thank you very much. I am not going to be swept into hell in an evil time. I am going to swim upstream to heaven. And he tells us how that is. In verses 14 and 15 of Amos 5, he says, Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, as I have said. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. How do you change an evil time into a good time? Hate evil. Love good. Establish justice. It's that simple. And you might say, well, the times are just too evil for that to happen. Really, are they? Our times are evil. There's no doubt about it. Anarchy reigns in the streets. People are hating on one another because of their race. Injustice is everywhere. And yet, there have been times when it was much, much worse. One of those times is what we've been talking about, Juneteenth. There wasn't a family in America that hadn't lost someone because companies were recruited from towns there were towns all over America where the entire male population many times were wiped out in a single battle. 
Shiloh and Gettysburg, Chickamauga, Cold Harbor. The suffering was terrible. And yet, America overcame that. How did America overcome all that evil? The evil of slavery and war and loss and hatred and animosity. America, once again, loved what was good, hated what was evil and establish justice in the gates. Now, it's been a struggle and an imperfect one. And yet, things have improved. And by God's grace, they'll continue to improve. But whether they do or whether they don't depends entirely upon you and me as individuals. Are we, am I, going to be a person, a person of integrity, a person who loves what is good, a person of integrity who hates what is evil, and a person of integrity who does proactively establish justice in the world in which I live, in my house, with my family, with my friends, on my street, with those with whom I work, the people, especially in the congregation in which we worship. Are we consistently that person? Are we a person who loves good, hates evil, and establishes justice? I hope and pray that you are, and I wish you a very happy Juneteenth. God bless you. Until next time, my name is Russ McCullough, and this has been brought to you by the Archdale Church of Christ in Charlotte, North Carolina. You can find us at archdale.org on the World Wide Web. Thank you.